for the first time, it just made sense. And it was like somebody turned the light on in a room that I'd been fumbling about in the dark, trying to figure out where things were. So I quit bumping into things and falling over things. And, you know, um, it really was like a, a light just turned on for me. Welcome to Adulting on a Spectrum. In this podcast, we want to highlight the real voices of autistic adults, not just inspirational stories, but people like us talking about their day-to-day -day life. Basically, we want to give a voice to a variety of autistic people. I'm Eileen Lam, an autistic author and photographer, and I co-host this podcast with Andrew Camro. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Eileen. I'm Andrew Camro, an autistic entrepreneur, co-host of this podcast. And today, our guest is Ross... Voorhees, uh, because he said, I found it super interesting, for he's a golly, jolly good fellow is a way to pronounce it from just before the podcast. So um, I did that right. Anyway, about eight years ago, Ross finally figured out that he was on the spectrum. Even after becoming a mental health therapist prior, he wound up writing a book about what he learned about autism from both perspectives and how that's changed his work with his clients who are also on the spectrum. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So we like to um, start off each podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you listened to our podcast before? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so as, as you know, we like to start off by asking everyone how they like to be identified. And we actually do keep a running total of this for uh, the preference, uh, sure. unscientific as it may be. But how do you prefer to be identified? We don't mean she, her, person, but we mean person with autism, autistic, on the spectrum. Do you have a preference? It really doesn't bo bother me, however people want to say it, as long as it's, you know, something uh, not profane. But <laughs> because, uh, you know, for me, I, I, I don't feel the stigma, you know, any kind of stigma attached to it. So it really doesn't bother me um, how, how I'm addressed. I, I personally use autistic or autism a lot, you know, to, when I'm talking about myself, uh, even to my wife. So, right. Well, that's another one because we're starting like keeping track of uh, the answers we're getting. And okay. I feel like the last 10 episodes, people are like, eh, I don't care. So, it's yeah. really interesting to me because, yeah, when you're on social media, you would feel like there is a very like black and white, wrong and right answer to that question. But really, most people just like, don't care. Eileen, you mean to tell me that people with autism have some black and white thinking? Isn't that crazy? Really? Wow. I've never heard, I should write that down. Can you tell us about your diagnosis journey? Like what led you to your diagnosis? And that was pretty late in life, right? I guess the best way to describe it is, you know, for the first um, five decades of my life, I was just kind of, I felt often like I was just fumbling about in the dark. I mean, I had a lot of, of pretty severe episodes of depression and, and anxiety and obsessive compulsive, you know, disorder behavior. And um, uh, so, you know, consequently, like a lot of people on the spectrum, you know, I, I went to therapy for that. I had a variety of therapists and little did they know that one day they would you know, become my uh, role models. And, uh, but that's kind of what happened. And, um, I mean, I, I couldn't even, you know, go outside of the, uh, we lived in Wichita, Kansas and, and, and for the longest period of time, I mean, just even going outside of the, of the city limits was, you know, panic inducing to me. Uh, and I would try to push myself and I would try to, you know, get past it. And it just seemed kind of impossible. And, and, you know, if someone would have told me that I would be where I'm at now, uh, Back then, I, I would have laughed at him um, because I did I I just thought that that's the way it was going to be all my life. So, and then um, <laughs> fun. It's funny, but we wound up moving um, from Wichita to uh, Mesa, Arizona, uh, for three years, and uh, and it was necessity. My my wife's job 
was requiring her to move there if she wanted to continue working and she'd had quite a career already with the company and and um I don't know just strangely I kind of found myself when she told me I mean she was like literally crying because she knew how hard it was for me and um she couldn't imagine that she just thought it was going to be a big disaster and I, I think I was as surprised as she was when I said you know what we'll get through this together and from that day on I just was able I mean I'm not saying that everything just went away immediately of course it didn't but I was able to have a much more kind of wait and see attitude about things and just take them as they come, um, which I really hadn't had before. And it was really kind of, I guess, an adventure. <laughs> um, again, not that it was always easy, not that there wasn't still problems, not that I didn't still face difficulties, but that was, I think, really the turning point for me. And then after we were there for a couple of years, I thought about going back to school and I thought that, you know, I was really kind of drawn to being a counselor because during that time, I often called upon the things that I'd learned in therapy and, um, and you know, remember those things and put and actually practice them and, and they were effective for me. And, you know, it's not unusual for a lot of people in the mental health field um, to have been so profoundly affected by somebody else who's helped them that they feel compelled to do the same thing in return. It's kind of a, you want to return the favor sort of thing. So I went back to school at 52 and got my master's degree in social work. And, and here we are. Um, when I found out about, well, <laughs> my uh, supervisor at the time and colleague, um, now colleague, uh, one day I was kind of just, you know, bemoaning the fact that um, people sometimes got me really wrong and it, and it just really bothered me. And, and, you know, it was just kind of, it was, I guess, kind of a complaint session or something, but, you know, sometimes that really uh, caused me a lot of doubt about what I was doing and whether I should even pursue becoming a therapist. And, um, you know, one day I said, I, I just don't get why people get me so wrong sometimes. And maybe even, and I don't know if you, either of you have ever experienced this, but, you know, uh, interpreted as even dangerous or something, you know, because people just think you're strange or, or notice your oddness and go to kind of the worst case scenario, I think, which is very common, but that's a, another story. And I said something to her about that. She just, well, I think it's because, you know, you're, you're just kind of, too forward with people before they get a chance to know you. Does that sound familiar at all? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, really? She's like, yeah. Like, oh, and I'd always been that way. When people would tell me things, I was, you know, that helped me kind of navigate, you know, social things and society better. I was always grateful for it. I never took it as a negative or took offense to it or anything like that. And so when she told me, I was just kind of like, oh, and, that, and, you know, um, maybe an hour later, I was thinking about that in my office and I thought, gosh, that sounds a lot like autism, <laughs> you know? And so uh, I started kind of, it, that changed my perspective and I started reflecting on other incidences I'd faced in my life. And it just, for the first time, it just made sense. And it was like somebody turned the light on in a room that I'd been fumbling about in the dark trying to figure out where things were. So I quit bumping into things and falling over things. And, you know, um, it really was like a, a light just turned on for me. So, and then that got me thinking about writing. And, and uh, as I learned more about autism and developed a better understanding of it. And, and I mean, it, it had kind of been staring me in the face all my life. I just, didn't recognize it, I guess. What was the diagnosis process for you like? How did you um, start and, and go through that? Well, I haven't been been um, diagnosed by a, by a psychologist. You know, I haven't done the testing and stuff. I mean, for me, it's more, uh, you, you know, we, we use what's called the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic mm -hmm. uh, uh, manual for 
mental health disorders and things. And, and I think it's kind of, in some regards, unfortunate that it's in that manual. <laughs> um, I don't always see it as a, as a, uh, as a mental disability at all. Uh, and we can talk more about that um, later if you want to know more, but uh, that was what I had to refer to. And uh, I, I just was able to, I guess, kind of not officially diagnose myself, but um, between that and just the way it helped me make sense of my life and, and uh, understand aspects of myself um, in a way that I never could before, um, that was enough for me. And I even mentioned in the book, you know, that I, I think that the, you know, and, the, and I don't know how other people feel about this or other people on the spectrum feel about this, but I, I do think that if it makes sense to people, if it helps them make sense of their life and, and in a way that's different, I think that in and of itself is the best diagnosis because you can be diagnosed with something and not at all, still not identify with it. It's absolutely true. Um, What's interesting is most of we've had a a fair amount of autistic uh, clinicians, you know, social workers, you know, therapists Mm -hmm. come on. And I think you're the first one uh, to be self-diagnosed or only self-diagnosed. And uh, because what we've noticed is most uh, clinicians, right, Mm -hmm. part of their job is diagnosing. So they Mm -hmm. see the importance in an official diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there a reason that you... Uh, have not gone after one. You just see no need. Uh, most people find, again, even the clinicians who all knew they were sure, right, learned some mm-hmm. valuable insights. So, no, and I know it's something that I could do. And I've actually, you know, like gone. On, I I know that there's a lot of um, of online testing, and there's some some clinical online testing stuff that I that I've actually gone on and and done. And I and I'm certified as an autism therapist and. I, again, I guess, I guess it just, you know, at a certain point, um, it didn't seem that important to me. Um, for me, it was just, you know, at, at that, it's just kind of, it's like, you know, when I, when I got my degree in social work, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work with, with people. I knew I wanted to be a clinical therapist. Now, as a social worker, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You could be case managers, you can you can go in, you, you can work in hospitals. I mean, there's a thousand different things you could do, but I already knew what I would, wanted to do. And so, uh, you know, uh, instead of getting a, a LSC uh, W license, which is licensed clinical social worker, I just went for mental health, you know, uh, a uh, certified mental health therapist because, um, or licensed mental health therapist, because I already knew what I wanted to do. And so I guess, just for me it was always been about that i guess i don't know does that answer your question i, I think so more yeah. or less yeah yeah that was now you got me curious and <laughs> so now now i probably will you know but uh, yep. i have i haven't known a whole lot of you've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people like you said that that are our therapists and clinicians that have actually been diagnosed and i guess i just didn't know that mm-hmm. most people did, and I'm happy to do it. No, I mean, that's just been our experience with a limited sample of people on the podcast. Sure. It would not yeah. hold up to uh, to any academic research standards, I'm pretty sure. Well, you so. can have me back on again for another episode after I get officially diagnosed or something. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> yeah, I guess there is, uh, you know, some self-bias, right? It's, uh, it's difficult to... Uh, it's kind of like when there is something wrong with you physically and you go to Google and it's going to tell you you have cancer, right? I mean, and I know you have that added experience being a therapist yourself, but you know, when you want something, you're going to mm-hmm. be, you're going to be like seeing those symptoms and traits, characteristics, I guess we don't say symptoms in yourself, you know, to mm-hmm. confirm uh, what you want to be true. Because like you said, that's sure. It's like the light turned on and all of that, you know? So yeah. having that outside perspective, I think is like very valuable. Um, you know, not to say you're not, but just uh, I think that's why people tend to like seek out an outside perspective on that. I know when I was sure. diagnosed, um, it wasn't just my perspective. There was like the psychologist interviewed uh, my husband, uh, my uh, my parents, you know, 
friends so she could get like the full picture um, and in the end some questionnaires i filled out the same as other people in my family and the answers were like very similar so that was like a confirmation that what i was seeing in myself those people outside were also seeing in me right uh, but when you're the only person i think that's when the you know doubt can uh yeah and, and I think there may be something generational to that too. I mean, I'm you know I'm I'm 62, so I'm a little bit older of a generation than, um, and it may be that that maybe younger people are are you know or younger generations are just that that our adults are actually um, more open to that. I suppose again, it just didn't seem like something that was personally important to me, um, and and I understand what you're talking about self bias. Yeah, we see that all the time, and 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 I see that all the time. And uh, I, you know, I I have to say it's not a convenient diagnosis. I don't know that it's convenient for anybody other than it helps them under maybe understand themselves or, like you said, confirm what they suspect. You know. You know, I think you being older is that an okay thing to say? Probably. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably not on social media as much, and you know there is that right. growing movement of people self-diagnosing and then speaking on yes. the, the entire community. So yep. I think now there's like stigma around self-diagnosis, uh, and you know people using it as an as a weapon. Mm. Weapon. Sure. It's the you know diagnosed autistic people and people like my son who has a level three autism, nonverbal, and they're using that self-diagnosis to say that speak on behalf of the entire community and i think right. that's why you now like self-diagnosis you know but you know in your case i i understand and that's why you know we like having people from different backgrounds on the podcast to hear those perspectives well and and you know i i guess i just wasn't aware of the extent of of, of um how much that is because you know i had been very active on social media in the past but one of the things that i also learned one of the things that my colleagues stressed stressed to me my supervisor was the kind of the danger of of social media you know beyond a certain point in fact there was just an article that came out um i think it was yesterday that talked about that one of the biggest improvements to mental health is seen for people who limit themselves to half an hour of of social media that just by doing that it actually vastly improves their their mental health so it, which i find really interesting and uh, i think in the book i talk a little bit about social media too um, and, and, and I, I think like anything, it can be absolutely a, a force for good. Um, you know, uh, but I have seen and understand the, the other viewpoint and, you know, the books that have been written about the dangers of social media and, and things like that. But, um, so I haven't been active on social media, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, without being a, a fire hose of information <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, I haven't been on it that much, but I, I I can see how people would absolutely use that to draw attention to themselves, almost like it's in fashion or it's a fad, you know, and, and, and that just kind of is um, undignified for, for all the people who have been officially diagnosed. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is self-diagnosis and self-diagnosis and, you know, it's hard to, uh, yeah, see, see the difference sometimes. And so, yeah, complicated issue, complicated answer, but I appreciate you sharing why you, you did, you did that. Um, so do you look back at how you treated any autistic clients before you had a better understanding of yourself and like almost snap yourself in the head because you didn't know at the time you had autism and now you have like a whole new understanding of things? Yeah, I mean, I I, I um, believe that, uh, well, I, I absolutely work with people that, I, that, that um, I've encouraged to, to become diagnosed uh, with you know, with uh, or confirm a diagnosis of, of autism, um, but again, what I look at more than anything, I think, is is how that might help them understand themselves and their own mental health and kind of take charge of that. I think there's value in understanding um, the mechanics 
and I, and I know, uh, at least for me, that's something that I value very highly is understanding the mechanics of it. Because sometimes we have to draw on our logic to counter our emotional, you know, our, our tendency towards certain emotions. And and uh, I, I <laughs> have often relied on that personally, you know, to kind of give myself some balance. But um, I can't say that everybody that I work with is on the autism spectrum. I, I suspect a lot of them are, and I do encourage them to, to get uh, diagnosed. And in fact, um, a lot of people that I've, I've spoken to kind of wonder, uh, and, and as you said, it, this could be self-biased too. This could be something that we see because we're looking for it, but, you know, and, and this may be a wild statement, but I sometimes wonder if, if uh, the majority of people who voluntarily come in for mental health therapy are actually people that are on the spectrum, because that seems to be something that we see a lot of. Um, what I also find interesting is, is um, are, you, are you familiar with the, like the polyvagal theory? No, I am not. Are you, Eileen? Mm -mm. It, so the polyvagal theory is something that it, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Porges, um, P-O-R-G-E-S, came up with. And, and basically what he talks about is the way our brain is connected to our, our vagal nerve or our vagus nerve in our body. And vagus nerve is something that runs from the base of our brain stem and basically goes through all our internal organs, a lot to our face. Um, uh, it, it communicates information like the state of our body to our brain and our brain communicates to our body through that primary nerve. And there's two pathways through which that information is passed to our brain and back. Um, one of those is of a lower level pathway that's all about uh, fight or flight response. You know, when that's triggered, you know, we, we do go into our kind of fight or flight or, or anxious mode and uh, what he discovered was that um, in, in a lot of his research that individuals who uh, have an atypical brain um, don't have as strong of a higher level connection. And that higher level connection is something that we have in common with all mammals. And all mammals by nature find comfort in others. And that's kind of the mechanism that we have for finding comfort when we connect with other people. And that's part of what drives us. We're connection oriented as individuals. And what he discovered was that that, that higher level pathway isn't as active in people who have atypical brains. And what he also discovered is that there's more than one way to develop an atypical brain. You can be born with it, but you can also develop it from um, a, a, a significant or or sufficient uh, amount of early childhood trauma and and when you mean a typical brain you again you just mean people who think differently or you or yes. are you saying yeah. specifically autism it's hard to say he believes that that there's more than one way to autism that, that there is a absolute very very strong genetic um component which i absolutely believe in myself and but he also feels that 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 uh, children who've been uh, sufficiently affected by childhood trauma that are constantly forced into that fight or flight response because you've got to remember children's brains de are developing right, and so what he saw was that people who had significant amount of trauma exhibited the same kinds of of um, mental processes. He also discovered that people who are born deaf sometimes exhibit those same things. And one of the things that happens when our fight or flight response is triggered is our brain tunes away from uh, vocal frequencies and tunes more towards predatory frequencies, lower level, more guttural kinds of sounds. So we're literally, when we're activated um, from an anxiety standpoint, uh, our, our, our hearing shifts away from being able to hear um, vocal frequencies into these more predatory frequencies. And as a result, that might help explain why uh, there's often a delay in development or complete absence of, of, of speech in some individuals. So it's really interesting and it's, and it's really one of the pre prevailing theories uh, that, that explains a lot of things. And he actually found a way to um, uh, 
tune music to more into the vocal frequencies. And he um, has treated a lot of children with early autism, uh, a diagnosis with these headphones and, and uh, the, their social ability actually has improved from being able to hear these frequencies, these vocal frequencies that stimulates that those pathways and creates new neural pathways in the brain and, and, and actually helps improve some of their symptoms. I'm sorry, I know that's a lot, but. <laughs> yeah, um, and respectfully, uh, I, I disagree with his opinion, right? There can be lots of things that activate the flight or flight response through sure. trauma or other things that are not autism, right? And, and that's right. all the more reason to, you know, ha have an appropriate, you know, uh, therapy, diagnosis, treatment, sure. uh, et cetera. Uh, right. What are your thoughts on current, you know, autism, uh, you know, treatments that exist today? And are there any that are less talked about that you think should be more talked about? Well, I mean, kind of what's considered, uh, at least from my understanding, is that, you know, dialectical behavior therapy is often used, uh, which is basically you just kind of instructed on what to do and how to act. Um, I think, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is also um, utilized quite a lot. I know that uh, medication is often used. Can you used. explain the difference between DBT and CBT? They sound so yeah. similar. They must be the same. Can you can you remind me? Sure. Yeah. Dialectic behavioral therapy is, is more specific in that it, it, it um, basically says you're in this situation. This is what's actually going on. And this is how you respond to it. So it's basically telling people how to respond based upon the situation they're in. Cognitive behavioral therapy is more about the thought process and how, uh, you know, our tendency, like you said, um, black and white thinking, right? That's mm -hmm. that's kind of considered a, a cognitive, um, not error necessarily, but uh, um, not the most helpful way to approach things. <laughs> um, uh, often it's great for survival. Don't get me wrong. Black and white thinking is is wonderful for survival because being able to com, com, you know quickly differentiate between what's safe and what's dangerous is crucial right that's why we tend to think on a black and white you know all people not just people on the spectrum but all people uh, are very much um uh predisposed to um, black and white thinking um so anyway, so cognitive behavioral therapy is more about uh, the more general in terms of, you know, um, looking at something from a slightly different perspective, reframing things, yeah. you know, well, uh, yeah, it could be that this worst case scenario that you're worried about, it could be that that's, that's what this means, but could it also mean something less, you know, less dangerous or, or less stressful or, you know, possibly even good, you know, um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is more about how our thoughts affect our actions and our actions can affect our thoughts. Thank you for that. Appreciate yeah. It. So what I'm kind of proposing in the book is that, you know, maybe we should look at autism more as a culture rather than, um, you know, a, a, a diagnosis or just a, a deficiency or a, a, a disorder, you know, and I kind of, I, yeah, I, I, I think there's a part where I think it can be both. I, I don't think it's sure. one or the other. Yep. Um, and lucky for you, you don't spend a lot of time on social media. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think I think if you spent more time, you know, you'd see that again. Anything could be taken to extremes, right? But there's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it's hard to again the black and white thinking. I think there, I think there is a part where kind of it can be a culture for some people, but mm -hmm. then there's a lot where it isn't, right? I and don't, I don't mean like culture, like a group. I mean, uh, uh, you know, um, from a perspective. And let me explain what I mean that by do. that. Thank you. So I think what some things mean for neurotypical people don't mean the same thing for 
for atypical people, people who, who are on the autism spectrum. I think uh, a lot of the things that, and I'm just gonna use we here, think about, um, and the way we see things is different. And that, in other words, we're, we're, we tend to be very much more practical, right? We're practically oriented. We, we're literal. We, we take things literal. Um, you know, our sense of humor and stuff is, is, is different. And one of the things that we're taught, um, you know, is, is uh, in social work and in pretty much any mental health field is, you know, cultural um, sensitivity. That when someone comes in, for example, if I have a client who comes in who's a member of one of the tribes up here in the Pacific Northwest, I better know something about their culture so that I can recognize when something about them is reflective of their culture or even know to ask them. You know how 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 significant is is your involvement, say, in in tribal affairs or something like that, because that's a factor in in how they see things, how they perceive the world, and and um, for example, uh, back in the early 1900s, um, when police forces were first being established, uh, they had a huge number of of American Indians or Native Americans who were being um, arrested for crimes they didn't commit. And when they finally looked into why this was happening, what they discovered was, was that um, in the new, newly developing techniques to figure out whether someone was being deceitful and lying or was guilty, they would look at eye contact. And, and a lot of individuals, American Indians or Native Americans, um, wouldn't make eye contact. And, and they saw that as being, you know, uh, avoidant or, uh, you know, that they're hiding something. And that's not what it meant at all. From a cultural perspective, they were taught that you show your respect to elders and chiefs and people in authority by not engaging in eye contact with them. So once they understood that, they were able to go, wait a minute, this guy isn't being evasive. He's, he's Native American. And this is him showing respect to me or then they at least knew to ask about it. And so I think that's the importance. So what, what's the purpose of all this? Well, um, I, I think that if I'm in Rome, it's kind of unrealistic for me to act like, to, to think that everyone in, in Rome should act like an American. I should understand their culture and respect their culture and take that into account when I look at their behavior. And so uh, that's kind of the case I'm making, you know, hey, understand the, the culture of, of autism, not from this community, like culture as in community, but culture as in what things mean to people on the spectrum. Understand that they are, that we are more direct, that, that we see things differently, you know, and take that into account. And, and instead of that being a, a diagnostic criteria, it's something to kind of celebrate, I think, and so I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Like it was very interesting to hear about the Native American story and you know how to them respect is not making eye contact. And personally, like I hate making eye contact. Uh, like that's mm -hmm. something I trained myself to do. And I don't think you know anyone should be forced to you know make eye contact. So I totally like relate to a lot of what you're saying. But mm -hmm. there's a but. I think there is the unfortunate thing is that there are people on the autism spectrum whose characteristics are a lot more severe and it's not just yes. social norms you know like my son for instance he can't absolutely hurt, can't tell me if he's hurt can't tell me what his favorite color is you know he's like swallowing mm -hmm. coins like he threw up a coin like last weekend because he doesn't have a sense of danger he's intellectually disabled and so you know i think and maybe it's a separate issue it's the answer to a, a different uh question that you're, you're raising about the culture i think people should learn about autism and what it you know the, the symptoms that are the characteristics that are making autism it, I, I see what you mean by culture i'm gonna use the word culture because that's what what you you're using you know how just because we're acting differently doesn't mean it's you know a bad thing doesn't mean we're not respecting people totally get that i just want to make sure that by you know pushing the autism as an identity narrative we're not mm -hmm. forgetting about those for whom autism is like such a 
debilitating i never can never say that word right uh condition you know the people who have like such intense uh symptoms and shreds of, of sure. autism. no i completely understand what you're saying and and i'll just i'll just read you a little bit of this the second paragraph of the of my book in the introduction it says first of all i'd like to clarify that when I refer to autism or any of its associated terms within this book, I'm generally referring to what is termed high-functioning autistic individuals. High-functioning individuals with autism used to be diagnosed as having Asperger's syndrome, but the latest diagnostic manual folded this distinction into, into the broader diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD as it's often referred to. The end result is that the term ASD applies equally to those least affected by autism to the most profoundly affected individuals because autism is, after all, now viewed clinically as a spectrum. However, I also don't believe that the material in this book excludes anyone with autism, regardless of where they might fall in the spectrum to say otherwise would mean that I presume to know who might or might not benefit from this book. And the fact is autism simply doesn't work that way. Every human being is unique with unique abilities and capabilities, whether autistic or not, and that includes the capacity for finding their own measure of peace, meaning, and purpose in life. So I completely, I could not agree more with you. Okay. And I just wanted you to know that I recognize that and, and make that as a crucial, important distinction. I love so, that. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question then, because sure. I, I love that paragraph. Thank you for, for reading it. Uh, sure. Do you agree with the new DSM-5 as a psychologist, or do you think that it should be rewritten to separate between what used to be called Asperger's and those more profoundly af affected by autism? Well, you know, um, I, I think, you know, you, <laughs> it's, it's like the broader term. Personally, I don't, I don't agree with it. I, I, I think that there needs to be a distinction. Um, And I know I'm not the only one that disagrees with that. Uh, but you know what? Uh, as a therapist, I have to work with with what I'm I'm told to work with. You know, that's kind of the reality. Uh, I, I you know can't diagnose Aspergers anymore. Yeah. As far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. You know, when I was diagnosed, it was just like a year or two after the, the changes uh, in the DSM. And uh, the psychologist told me, you know, if it was a couple of years ago, you would have been diagnosed with uh, Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of uh, professionals are like, kind of still like, like that term and that distinction and will use it in a, how do you say, uh, non, what's the word, a non-official way, right? Just to like right. explain uh better mm -hmm. i mean because it, it makes things confusing how someone like us having this conversation on zoom you know very we we're talking about very important topics can have the same diagnosis as someone who needs help at 27 uh, you know going to yeah. the bathroom, eating speaking you know it's makes things confusing and i don't think the spectrum quite uh explain the differences enough no. and i would and i would just say i have a son with down syndrome and i have and who is also autistic and a son with autism who's 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 verbal and but he's very much affected by his diagnosis so you know and i and you know i i've had them long before and had to under get to know that and understand that long before uh you know, I was ever even the idea of even being a therapist was something in my head, you know, and I also want to say I very much identify with the not being able to make eye contact because I'll often look up and away from my my clients and uh, sometimes they'll turn their head <laughs> to look and see if they can see what it is that I'm looking at because they think I'm looking at something else. And so sometimes I just I kind of explain that, you know, that's just what I'm thinking you know, or something. So, yeah, I, I completely uh, understand that. And, and I guess what I should say in terms of, of um, and I do kind of think that 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 Dr. Porges is onto something with the, his polyvagal theory. Make, that makes a lot of sense to me. What he's saying there is that 
and maybe that's the differentiation. He's saying in a typically structured brain, and that is people who have um, uh, a, a constricted or non-existent higher level pathway that allows them to find comfort. And so they exist primarily always in anxiety and stress is maybe a better way to explain what it is he's trying to, to, to say w when he says that people there's more than one way to get to an atypical brain. And I think he does make that distinction. I don't think he ever uses autism specifically in any of his, his work. I may be wrong, um, but uh, he is explaining it purely in kind of neurological um, or neurophysiological terms. So, so I, I also wanted to kind of circle back around and, and say that, and I, by no means do, do I, Am I in any way suggesting or diminishing, you know, individuals who are on the autism spectrum and saying, oh, no, you know, uh, um, you know, people who who suffer, you know, childhood trauma could be there too. But I do see a lot of people, and that it seems to be something significant that they've gone through. And I see do see a lot of the same ways of thinking and and behaviors, the inability to meet eye contact, a lot of the, you know, same kind of things and. Unfortunately, um, another reason why I kind of put forth this whole idea of, of understanding the culture is so that therapists understand that when, when therapists who are typical or have a typical brain make a diagnosis, they may, are making it from their perspective and they're assigning meaning basic, based on, on behaviors that they see in clients based upon their personal understanding of what those behaviors mean. And so my point in the, that I try to make in the book is that uh, you have to look differently. You have to understand the culture of autism. You have to understand what that means and make your diagnosis, not based upon what it means to you as a neurotypical individual, but what it means to that person. And why is that important? Well, um, the highest misdiagnosed group of people in the world are people with autism spectrum disorder. They're often diagnosed, women are most often diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and men are most often diagnosed with, with um, either antisocial or, or uh, uh, what's the word, um, narcissistic personality disorder. And the, the treatments and everything are completely different for that. And I've actually had people come in that were diagnosed with, with borderline. And I'm like, wait a minute, this doesn't look like borderline at all to me as I get to know them and understand them. And, and, I, and I said, you know, you should be tested for autism. It turns out they're autistic. And suddenly they go from, I mean, I have one client that was that living in, their, in a barn on a farm, uh, you know, uh, to having their own place and going back to school and starting a career and their life that just blossomed. So prior to that, they were going down this path of what they've been diagnosed with and, and it was just grinding them into the ground and it just opened up the world for them. And I, I, that's a big you know, influence for why I kind of went with what I went with, I guess. I hope that- it, That, that makes sense. Do you have any special interests other than autism? If so, oh, what absolutely. are they? Okay, oh you didn't gosh. share any in the bio. Okay, what else do you like <laughs> to do? Um, Who knew Eileen likes what the the where you drive fast? Formula One. There you go. Right, yeah. Eileen. Yes. yes. Uh, I I love the typical um, uh, nerd stuff. Uh, you know, but there I go using a, a stereotypical label again. I love okay. science fiction. I love. Um, what uh, what kind of science fiction? Going, oh, all kinds. Uh, I, I I I mean I everything from Guardians of the Galaxy to Interstellar. I mean it can be really deep or it can be very surface level. But I I really like I, right now. I love um, Foundation on I Apple. Gonna, I was gonna yes, I love I'm, that show. We're I like think. the only two people who watch it. I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've made my wife watch a few episodes. Oh, yeah, mine too. So, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're at four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, that, it's impressive that that's a very hard book to make into a movie. For people who don't know, the this show takes place over a thousand years. What's this... that? Okay. 
<laughs> uh, a uh, communicator from the original Star Trek, the original series. Cool. That's how my deck work. I love um, I, I love making uh, models. I love making you know. I, I'll spend months doing a model and just trying to make it as realistic looking as I possibly can. And I didn't used to be that way. I used to be as fast as I could, but I eventually learn how to slow down and and stick with something for the long haul um love music um all kinds of music my wife played in symphony and i got the pleasure and honor of going to see a lot of people in the symphony and developed an appreciation for that i love classic rock i love grunge rock i love uh jazz all kinds of stuff. I have uh, a few more questions for you, and these are quick fire mm-hmm. questions. So if you've listened to okay. the show before, you know what they're mm-hmm. like. Yes. So, first question What is your favorite animal? Cats. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. What book are you currently reading or the last one you read? Um, Hyperion. What is your favorite food? Uh, vegetarian pasta dish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> favorite color? Uh, purple. Are you on social media at all? I, see, I know you have YouTube. Uh, do you want to share where people can find you on social media? Do you want to share about your book? Any self-promotion? Anything goes right now. If you if you type my name in uh, in in um, uh, on Amazon, the book will come up. Um, uh, that's the best way to find it. Uh, I have started doing some stuff. Um, you asked if I had special interests. Well, I used to be in amateur radio, and I figured out how to make the, an antenna for HD televisions. And so I put that video up and it went viral and it's had over 3 million views. Um, wow. Yeah. But that was, that was like, you know, 15 years ago. So let's see it. I want to, yeah. Do it. <laughs> um, so unfortunately I didn't really make any money off of it. It would have been great, but uh, yeah. So that's still up there. And then I, I actually went back to the channel and changed the channel name to an autistic therapist and uh, I'm trying to put some stuff up there um, that just addresses uh, issues that I discovered after learning um, or coming to believe that I was, let me correct myself, coming to believe that I was autistic. Um, and I am gonna get officially diagnosed by the way. Um, and uh, uh, things that I encountered after learning about that and things that I had to navigate and and find out about that I hope will be helpful to people. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us today. Honestly, sure. you know, I don't agree on everything, but I enjoyed learning from your perspective. And I think it's it's interesting to have these conversations when we don't agree. Sure. I think that's that's well, life. And, right? and I don't hold, hold out that any of my answers are the right answers because I know better than that. That's not just That's just not the way it works. These are my answers. And I just hope that my answers might be helpful for somebody. That's all. That's a great way of looking at it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank Thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye.